to have banned Halloween. But not this one. <laughs> yeah, what, says Laura? <laughs> what? Some churches have banned Halloween, but not this church. We go all out, don't we? Darth Vader, costume parade. The youth group hosted an intergenerational dance on Friday, and if you missed it, you really missed out. There were devils, of course, a witch, a couple of dark fairies, and a transformer pirate fairy. <laughs> One kid, three expressions of Halloween. <laughs> My husband wore a banana costume. Christine came dressed as a binder full of women. <laughs> We drank slime punch, and I was really proud of the youth group for doing what we all talk about so often, getting the generations together. I love how we embrace scary things around here. Not just Halloween either, but some of the other things that scare people. Difference, for example. We really try to embrace difference. We run toward it, and we are therefore the rare church that includes theists and atheists and other stripes of religious belief, openly sharing Sunday worship side by side. And we run toward difficult theological questions. We're going to do a little bit of that this morning, but I'll try not to scare you too much. Some other churches may have banned Halloween, but all, all of us have our monsters, right? And the famous, the most famous church monster mascot is Satan, yeah? The scary guy who tries to lead you astray, who wants to make a deal with you, temporary power or pleasure in exchange for your soul. And some relig religious groups take their fear of Satan or the devil so far as to believe that anyone or anything that challenges their doctrines or practices must be one of the devil's tricks. There's another kind of fear we often think of when we think of religion, and that's the fear of God. Now, if you were not raised Unitarian or in some other kind of Universalist church, if you were raised in a more conservative church, or even if you weren't raised in any church, but many of the kids and adults around you were part of one, your school friends and your grandparents, for example, then you might have been taught that the fear of God means fear of God's judgment. You might have been taught or you might have picked up on the idea that people should be afraid of God because God has the power to send them to hell or to make misfortune rain down in their lives. And the logic goes that this fear of making God angry, of making God want to do these things, will lead us to behave ourselves and follow the rules, however we understand them. Of course, different churches interpret God's rules differently, and that can stir up anxiety because how do we know for sure that we have the right set of rules while others are wrong? And why would God let there be so much confusion about the rules anyway? I mean, if this God is so powerful, why let little children be born into wayward churches or families? Once you start down that path of questioning, it gets really messy, and there are some terribly complicated theologies that try to explain it all and package it up, but the truth is that when you start out with a fear-based theology, none of it adds up to a God that is very inspiring, and it has a way of leaving you feeling guilty. Like there's a huge weight on your shoulders because, let's face it, we are all sinners. We have a hard time consciously, consistently following our own rules, never mind someone else's. When I was interning as a hospital chaplain, one of the things we were taught to look out for is patients who don't comply with their treatment plans because they think their illness or injury is God's punishment for them for something. That happens. People get so caught up in their fear that they forget to consider that, hey, maybe God sent the helpful doctors and the medicine and the chaplain, too. After all, God is also famously forgiving. But actually, fear of God does not only mean fear of God's judgment or wrath. That paternalistic or fatherly idea about God, that God's like a parent who will punish you, is an oversimplification of the meaning in the ancient Bible stories. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. 
First, I want to point out that as much as fear can shake us up and even do some damage in our lives, we are kind of addicted to it. Some of us more than others. How many of you like psycho thrillers like Twilight Zone or Alfred Hitchcock or Black Swan? <laughs> How about horror movies? Anybody? A few, yeah. Those are changing over the years. They're getting gorier. I watched Jaws with my family a while back and the special effects will make you laugh now. Now I know there were scarier movies made in the 80s, some classics, but I didn't see those because I'm a huge, huge chicken. <laughs> I really am, I can't do it at all. But I know that others love the genre and they love feeling afraid. Now I don't have to tell you that some kinds of fear are obviously good. The adrenaline we get when we encounter an aggressive dog or an unfriendly stranger on a dark street. There are lots of examples like that of the brief fight or flight kind of fear that clues you into danger. That's all right, you need that. But then there's the kind that's represented by those scary movies and by Halloween. Nobody dresses up as an aggressive neighborhood dog <laughs> or a slightly threatening stranger, right? We dress up as monsters, zombies, ghosts, or characters from fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood or the wolf, princesses, goblins, witches, things that live not in our neighborhoods, but in our psyches. Now from a preacher's perspective, that is much more interesting. The psyche fears. Those everyday things that make you jump and run, we can resolve those by just distancing ourselves from them or walking with a friend. But with monsters, zombies, and ghosts, not only are we unable to distance ourselves, because how can you distance yourself from something that doesn't really exist? We're drawn toward them. If not in horror movies, then at least in a good story, like Grimm's fairy tales, right? Rapunzel, Hansel and Gretel, Cinderella, Snow White. If you thought Cinderella and Snow White were Disney stories, I don't blame you. They have been Disney-fied, along with many others, but they're old, old stories, and they used to be much scarier. I don't know about you, but when my kids were little, I thought the Disney version of the fairy tales was scary enough. What's with the mothers? <laughs> they're, they're always killing off mothers or portraying evil stepmothers. But the original ones were even worse. When Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm set out to collect them from German folk in the early 1800s, when they went out into the countryside and they talked with grandmothers and tailors and farmhands, the tales they received were filled with terrifying images, swallowed and regurgitated children, severed limbs, and dreadful punishments for those stepmothers or sisters in barrels of nails or red-hot iron shoes. And then there were the sexual references. In the original version of Rapunzel, the prince's visits to her tower are revealed to the queen when Rapunzel naively asks why her dress is getting tight around her middle. Now, I'm not gonna overanalyze that. <laughs> the Freudians have already had their fun. <laughs> And the tales have been Christianized and moralized and Disneyfied to death, but in reality, they're not moral tales. They're mortal tales. They're stories that, like today's scary stories, take up primal matters. Being scared is just part of being alive. It's a primal experience that, as soon as we're conscious of being alive, we get worried about death. And when things are going well, we sometimes feel afraid of bad things happening. That's why the stories are so scary. They're true, not in a factual way, but in a way our psyches understand very well. Now, if we worry about whether it's really appropriate for children to hear about child-eating witches, mothers dying and wolves trying to trick little kids. Well, some kids definitely are too sensitive for those things, but others are already thinking about and wondering about scary possibilities. In fact, when my own daughter was barely three years old, it was her question from the back seat of our old Volvo, Mommy, what would happen if you died? That nudged me back into a church community for the first time in years. 
Another young person I know, a teenager whose mom worked with me at a church back east, decided to confront her fears by listing them all together. Number one, sharks. Number two, abductors. Snakes, spiders, getting raped. Cockroaches, getting a paper cut on her eye. <laughs> getting held at gunpoint, failing school. She came up with 48. Some of them seem relatively minor or unlikely, like the insects or the one about the paper cut. Some are really creepy, just the kind that those horror movie writers would love to know about. I'll spare you those images. But others were weightier. Drowning, cancer, falling from a high place, being alone, rejected, disowned, or unloved. She listed all of those. Her list included the unexpected, things we can't control, unstoppable doom. These are definitely the caliber of fears that inhabit our psyches, and she was so young. Each of us has our own list, whether we've thought about it in quite that way or not. We all do because part of the deal we're handed when we're born is that along with the moments or hopefully the long years of joy and a sense of stability and well-being, we also inherit angst and anxiety, an awareness of the thin membrane between what is and what could be. And through monsters and fairy tales and other great works of storytelling, we explore this deal, these primal fears, in a safe way. Take monsters, for example. Monsters are unpredictable. They jump out from closets or from under beds, right? In our imaginations, anyway. They represent what we can't predict, things that change your life in an instant. If you're like me, you've wrestled with one of the most distracting ones, the monster of grim prospects. That's when you can't stop imagining something bad that could happen. In the ancient Greek legend of Orpheus and his love Eurydice, Orpheus descends into the underworld to retrieve her after she dies from falling into a nest of vipers. Hades and Persephone, who rule that place, are so moved by Orpheus's devotion to Eurydice that they agree to let her go on one condition. Orpheus can lead her back to the world above only if he leads her straight out without ever looking back, even once. With Eurydice right behind him, Orpheus ascends, but just as he approaches the gateway out of the underworld, a terrible thought occurs to him. What if Eurydice is not still behind him? What if he's lost her? And without another thought, he turns and looks just in time to see her disappear because he broke the deal. He was lured by the monster of grim prospects. Fear of the unpredictable or unexpected can really get us too. When my son was a little baby, maybe five or six months old, just old enough to start mimicking us. His older sister and I had a lot of fun playing with him by growling playfully at him. We'd say, rawr, and we'd tickle his little tummy and make him laugh. One evening, my husband, Carlos, was changing the baby's diaper, and the baby was lying there waving his arms and legs and making cooing sounds, and then all of a sudden, rawr, <laughs> he growled at his father. <laughs> and Carlos, who had never witnessed our little game, just about jumped right out of his pants. <laughs> Fear of the unexpected. Monsters or babies who catch you off guard. <laughs> How about ghosts? They represent the past. Fear of what we cannot change. Or maybe fear of accepting what is. Accepting the reality that we can't improve our pasts. Ghosts appear in our peripheral vision just off camera casting an eerie light onto the present. Or they can chase us. If there's something in your family's past that you're afraid is going to catch up with you or something in your past, you've got a ghost. It could be a fear that you'll die of the same cancer or heart attack as your parents at the same age or develop the same mental illness. Or maybe it's an old family secret. But all of you who are running from a ghost 
picture this. If you choose to stop running and just step to the side, most of the time, they'll blow right on past. Ghosts, the past, can't actually see you. You live in the ever unfolding present and are your own person with your own path. And what about zombies? Maybe they represent what's unstoppable, those things we can't control. But if we let fear take over our lives, we can end up like the living dead, the life in us limited by dread. In her book, When Things Fall Apart, the American Buddhist nun Pema Chodron tells the story of a man who went on a spiritual retreat in India to try to get rid of his negative emotions, especially fear. His teacher sent him to a tiny hut in the foothills. He went in and shut the door and began meditating. As it got dark, he lit a few candles to keep him company and went back to his meditation. Then, in the middle of the night, he heard a noise and opened his eyes to find a large king cobra swaying in the corner of the room. He couldn't get out of the hut without crossing the snake's path. All night, he struggled to keep his fear from undoing him or causing him to startle the snake. To make matters worse, during those long hours, the candles began blowing out. The last one was extinguished just before dawn. And in the darkness, Chodron writes, the man began to cry. Not from despair, but from tenderness. Having finally given himself over to the reality of being in the darkness with the snake, he finally also accepted his oneness and compassion with all creatures and his small place in the scheme of creation. In the darkness, he rose and bowed toward the cobra. When dawn arrived, the snake was gone. Had it even really existed? He confessed that he'd never know for sure. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Chodron talks about being nailed by life, finding yourself facing down a scary truth that you cannot run from. It's as if you just looked at yourself in the mirror, she said, and you saw a gorilla. The mirror is there, it's showing you, and what you see looks bad. You try to angle the mirror so you will look a little better, but no matter what you do, you still look like a gorilla. That's being nailed by life, the place where you have no choice except to embrace what is happening or push it away. Most of our biggest fears, those ones in our psyches, have to do with losing what is familiar, safe, and comfortable. Although impermanence is one of the most fundamental truths of life, we're naturally inclined to try to shelter ourselves from it. We're afraid of losing ourselves. When what I think I am dissolves, an unknown I stands momentarily in my place, says David Applebaum. When what I think I am dissolves, an unknown I stands momentarily in my place. Then you become acquainted with your essential self, what some might call your soul. So it is that fear is a natural, inevitable part of drawing closer to truth and enlightenment. This brings us back to that fear of God we started with, what the theologian Rudolf Otto coined the term numinous to describe what we are encountering when we have the fearful experience of encountering God or the ultimate. It's a feeling of shrinking and awe, of trembling, but also of attraction, fascination, and being one with the divine. Some people have reported that only after an experience of the numinous did they begin to believe or deepen their belief in God or some transcendent spirit. But you don't have to be a theist to experience the numinous. I've had that same experience when standing before a massive expanse of the Atlantic Ocean or at the foot of Mount Hood, which rises 11,000 feet above the roads below. Listening to a great symphony can also cause that feeling of smallness, trembling, awe, and merging into something larger than yourself. It's the experience of 
dissonance, incompatibility between the ego, that part of you that wants to cling to things that are not permanent, and the infinite from which you emerged and are also made. You and everyone you love and everything that scares you, all made of the same stuff. Like a symphony, that infinite stuff, or God, which is in everything, all plays together in our lives, and we are players in it, co-creators. We go through our lives loving and setting more loves and more processes into motion. You make an impact throughout your whole life. It matters who you are and what you devote yourself to. We can be constructive, building up tangible things like a new sanctuary place for honoring all that is our lives, or intangible things like the community that gathers and dances on Halloween. Or we can be destructive. We have that power. We have to use it carefully. Life can be scary, but there's more to you than the things that scare you. Courage is living into those things, even though you sometimes feel afraid. Go live boldly. A closing hymn is number one. May nothing evil cross the store.